another episode of First Down by Coach Tools. Today I'm here with Coach O, who is an 18-year veteran. Thanks for coming on, Coach. Justin, good to see you. I appreciate you having me. You look good. Sure. And hopefully you're enjoying this thing and Coach Tools doing a heck of a job. Thank you. Coach O and I, we originally connected, I believe it was two years ago, correct? Yeah. So I reached out to him when I was first graduated, just got started with Coach Tools, and he offered me some advice. Um very generously. So I thought it would be a great opportunity just to speak with Coach O, who's been at many different universities over the years, including Oberlin, um, Albright College, and some Division II schools as well. So to kick things off, can you just share with the audience a little bit about your background and, um, you know, about your coaching career over the years? Yeah, absolutely, Justin. 18 year college coaching vet, spent the past three years as the head coach at Oberlin College in Ohio five years at Baldwin Wallace University as the offensive coordinator under Jim Hilbert. Uh, before that, I was a head coach at St. Norbert College in De Pere, Wisconsin, uh, Colby College in the NESCAC for a couple of years, and spent two years at my alma mater, Winona State University in Minnesota as well. So it was a fun run, an absolute joy, and now I'm uh, proud to be part of Stryker Medical Device Supplies Company. Uh, as their representative here in Northeast Wisconsin, as I transitioned off the sideline to, and kicked off a new career in the real world. Very cool. So obviously you have a, a wealth of knowledge in the coaching profession. And what, what has that transition been like? And how have you attacked it? Maybe like you attacked getting into coaching like 18 years ago. Yeah, no, that's a great question. You know, I think as I looked at what I could do to kind of, uh, be competitive in my spirit and find something that I truly enjoy while balancing the life of of being a husband and a great father. I, I wanted to find something that kind of was similar to the recruiting chase and the competitive appeal. You, you cannot replace Saturdays on the sidelines for three hours, uh, but you can find great people, great culture. And I believe I found that at Stryker around uh, – a really impressive company uh, that has built itself from the ground up because of great people, great culture, and a competitive drive to be number one in the winning scenarios in this medical device field that I really enjoy. Impressive. So going back to earlier on in your career, you know, what advice would you give yourself and, and to the other young coaches out there that are watching, you know, to best prepare themselves for success in the future? Oh, that's great. You know, I think there's a lot of things as you get older, you look back on and, and you you recognize as stuff that you did well and stuff that you really didn't do well. I think A, Justin, is to be authentic. Be yourself. Don't try to recreate um, anything that isn't you, right? And I think people see authenticity players, no matter if they're 16 to 17 years old or 18 to 22 years old as a college football coach, see authenticity. Number two, uh, be overprepared, right? I think that's something that uh, a lot of good coaches I was lucky enough to be around uh, gave me is, is um, if you're prepared, now you can be prepared to find avenues A, B, and C, one, two, and three, because nothing's going to go the way you planned. And then C, have fun. I think you have to enjoy the college coaching profession. It's one that's unique. It's one that's endearing. It's one that affects those around you like no other profession at times. But if you don't enjoy it, uh, you're losing out on something that's pretty special. So I think the most important thing is you have to enjoy it, no matter what role you play and what position you're in, from being a GA up to being a head coach. Definitely. And on one of the most recent podcasts I did, Coach, one of the cool things we talked about was being adaptable. And, you know, how, how coaching has really changed and college football has changed especially over the past five to 10 years. And can you talk a little bit more about that sentiment of just never, never being complacent and always, always finding a way to get, get with the times if, if yeah. you follow there. No, that's, that's, that's so true, Justin. I think it started for me, it was 15 years ago in recruiting. I kind of learned a lesson bounce around the country and, and try to be as good as possible in that, having to recruit top-rated Division II, Division three student-athletes 
if I walked into a Catholic school in Philadelphia, right, I looked the part because you're shaking hands with some people and you kind of adapt to the environment that you're in. If I'm recruiting San Diego or went down to Florida a lot at BW, you threw on shorts and a flower t-shirt and said, I'm going to be a Floridian because I'm going to play in their sand and their space. So um, you have to be adaptable. And that's where it started for me. Number two, it's never about your X's and O's. I think it's always about your Jimmy's and Joe's. Um, and the more success I had on the field on Saturdays, trying to figure out how to coach some people, it's just really developing a game plan around your personnel. If you had a quarterback that could run a little bit, get plus one in your gap scheme and in your quarterback run game. If you had wide receivers that could play uh, in space, add some RPOs, get some screens going that you knew they could be really effective in that way. It's never about you. It's about the people that you have around you and who's in your locker room. And the more adaptable you can be in those avenues, I think the better off you're going to be. And I think the last part to be adaptable is, is, you can either complain about the space that you're in or you can adapt to it. You can grow because of it. And we're seeing a lot of that in terms of the transfer portal, like everyone's dealing with and how do you navigate NIL and otherwise and coaches, I think that uh, don't compromise, but are able to adapt to what 18, 22 year olds, what things are on social media, they're going to find themselves in the driver's seat. And at the end of the day, winning games, and that's that's difficult. It was, certainly was for me at the tail end of the past 18 years. I know it is for a lot of people, but uh, to adapt to the now is so important. And it puts you in a position to find out who's going to be in your locker room and really trust the progress that they can find them, uh, themselves individually that collectively goes to your team's success. Definitely. And one of the other conversations I had on here too was with Adam Brenneman, who's, he used to be a, a coach at I believe it was Arizona State yeah and now he's more so into like college football media but one of the things he was saying was as a successful college coach you really need to be like an elite recruiter and can you talk a little bit more about your experience as a recruiter and like what that meant for you to to be a successful recruiter yeah well Adam does an unbelievable job and I think that sets a platform for me where I found success and I really truly enjoyed recruiting. And I think if you're going to be a high level college football coach, you got to realize that it is the most important thing you do in that chair as a college football coach. Number one, everyone's going to say it's about relationships and it is. I think number two, the one thing I found is to find value with everyone that you come in contact with. And don't always forget that uh, yes, you're recruiting a 17, 18-year-old star player to enhance your locker room and make you a better coach at the end of the day, but you are recruiting their parents, their high school coach, their guidance counselor, and the more you equip yourself with information, that becomes more powerful for you to be a, an effective recruiter. Um, for me, it was FAFSA, right, in the Division three level, how to navigate that world of EFC numbers and help out families that may not have done that in the past. It's a first generation college student. When it's at the division two level and you're managing recruiting uh, budgets and scholarship dollars and otherwise, it's figuring out that yes, money matters, but it's not all about the money. It is about the relationship. And to be an elite recruiter, I think puts you in an echelon where you are valued within a staff like you would not believe uh, because they know, believe and understand that you are going to continue to put people in places to find success. And then finally, I think as a recruiter, it's got to be fully, you know, engaged in what the program is, is speaking about, but you individually have got to build a plan for each individual you're recruiting. When you walk into their home on a home visit, when you host them on campus for an official or unofficial visit, what is the plan for them to thrive, not just survive, but thrive, in their role as a student athlete and match them with some academic personnel on campus. Make sure they know some of the academic assistance that's there for them if in fact they need help, because they will. And then build a picture that not only starts with them as a freshman on a football field, but they're walking across a, a stage on senior day. 
And I think that piece of recruiting for me was always really important is what are your obligations and goals as a recruiter? And does that match the obligations, goals, and ambitions that they had and dreams that they had as a 17, 18 year old? And if you knew that, I think you went a long way in being an elite recruiter because they then saw a vision that you built for them, unlike anyone else that was individual to what they were dreaming about before they got on your campus and what they could accomplish once they stepped foot on your campus. Yeah. And what I found is like recruiting just comes down to if you're, if you're a good recruiter, you're an elite communicator. And for me in the world of business, and I'm sure you can attest to this being in business now too, is recruiting is so much similar. It seems to be at least, I, I can't speak from experience, but it seems to be a lot like, like sales and business where it's just like, you're transferring your confidence in yourself, your program, your beliefs to that recruit, their families, like their high school coach. So it, it really goes a long way to just not only be confident in yourself, but be confident that, like you were saying, the plan that you put forward for them is going to put them in the best, the best seat to succeed going forward. So, I mean, that's, that's really great to hear you, you talking about that, that in your own career over the years. Yeah, and there's truth to it, right? And I think if you walk into a school or a home visit or any type of recruiting platform where you're at a camp, my purpose there was to add value, right? Add value to an individual, add value to a, a conversation with a mom or a dad, add value to a coaching point, knowing that maybe you weren't going to get a kid to come to a Division three school, but you could add value to how they took their drop back as a as a quarterback or what route they were running or otherwise. You wanted to add value. And Justin, it is similar uh, to the business world. Now that I hopped into recruiting doctors and hospital facilities, um, I'm doing the same thing. I'm making sure that I add value to every conversation and opportunity that's presented there to make sure that they value what you're bringing to the table. And I think that was a testament to John Marska, Tom Sawyer, and guys that were head coaches, I thought did it really well, were authentic with the culture that we had, the mission statement that was presented as a football program, no matter what level, and then making sure that you kind of carried out that culture, added your own individualism to the recruiting piece. And then at the end of the day, you always wanted to be first. Um, yeah, it was Travis Walsh, I'll never forget, said, no matter if it's a recruiting visit day or a game day visit, or how many calls you were going to make as a GA, you always want to finish first. And I think if you carry that into the first part of your second, third, fourth year of recruiting, you become really good because you add volume, you add activity, and then you find out what your value is to every situation in that recruiting cycle. Yeah, and what I've found too is just the more, the more reps you can actually do, like it's not – it would be unrealistic to be confident without having any proof of, that you can do what you you say you can do. So like, for example, if, if you've never made a recruiting call, like it's on, un, it's unreasonable to think you're a good recruiter, but if you've made 500 recruiting calls, you know, it would be unreasonable to not be good because you've just done it so many times. And that's the thing, like, and that's what, what I love about football is that, the more times you do something, you know, as a player, the better you're going to get. And that sentiment just goes towards everything in life. And it's, it really is the perfect teacher of real life in, in a controlled fashion early on, which is exactly what I think young men and in sports in general, young men and women need. Yeah. And uh, there's truth to it, right? Not everyone understands it while they're playing. And sometimes you miss those points when you're coaching. But for me, um, when you talk about being comfortable, being uncomfortable, uh, there's truth to it. And the greatest, the lesson I learned in coaching is, is there's no playbook to recruiting. Sometimes there's no playbook to what to call when the game's tied 30 to 30 and there's three seconds left and you got one time out, right? It's got to come from your gut. It's got to come from those repetitions. And I threw myself into an uncomfortable situation hopping off the sidelines. I'm learning anatomy of bodies that I've never really done before and hopping into hospitals that I've never done. But um, 
you know, an influential figure, a manager here said, just jump in. And sometimes you learn by failure. And if you become comfortable in that state, I think you become better at your craft. And, uh, you know, what I've done now over the past three months is one of those, you know, regretful moments and coaching points that I think you forget about. You, you become comfortable after 10 years or 12 years. You're running the same offense, you know, and you're like, ah, we average 35 points a game. We're good. I think you always want to find out how good you can be, but also what avenues allow you to be better. And the more repetitions you can put yourself into being uncomfortable in a recruiting call, a new home visit, or otherwise, the better off you're going to be. And now you can kind of stand in your own platform, your own two feet, build your career, and find out how to be a position coach, an offensive coordinator, a head coach, and otherwise. But it's got to start from somewhere in the volume and activity that you put yourself into. And opportunities to learn, grow, and fail from those things uh, is instrumental, I think, to your success in coaching. Yes, sir. 100% agree there. So I know we're getting towards the end of the call today, Coach. Any last words you want to share with the audience before we do end today? Yeah, college coaching is unbelievable. Um, it is a profession that can can be the best. It can be the worst. It can be everything in between. But I think the effect that you have on 18 and 22-year-olds has been said many times before, but it's true. Um, it goes for a lifetime and there's not too many things you can do that go for a lifetime. So the influence, the time, the energy, the balance between being a coach, a husband and father is so, uh, much entrenched in me as a reality. Uh, and those that are doing it and doing it well, uh, the amount of respect and commence uh, that I have for them is, uh, is real. So it's been a lot of fun for me to kind of take a step back and watch from afar, but some really good coaches out there at all levels that are doing it uh, for the right reasons and winning games because they're doing it for the right reasons, which is fun to see. Yes, sir. Well, coach, it was a pleasure talking with you today. Thank you very much for sharing and, you know, best of luck as you embark on the new endeavor here. Justin, best of luck to you, man. You look good. You're doing big things. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.